Inspired by Julian Eilert's recent videos on rebuilding the PWM5 solar charge controller in various forms, the gumstick, the through hole, the femto versions, well, I wanted to revisit the Arduino version. I first built one following the design I found on Arduined.eu. This design uses a piece of perf board about the same physical size as an Arduino Mini to hold all of the external components. Pretty neat, but also quite tightly packed and actually quite difficult to solder. Further to this, I made a second version, which as you can see is quite a bit bigger, but that did make the soldering easier. I removed the power supply circuit from Julian's original design as well at that point using the onboard regulator on the Arduino Mini. It made the build easier and was using less parts, but in all honesty I made it less efficient and Julian commented on that video pointed out that where mine was consuming 28 milliamps his pick version was using just one. I took that comment as a bit of a challenge and went back to the drawing board and made a third version which used the 80 tiny 85, assuming that this would consume a lot less. It did, just 11.5 milliamps at full speed, and I got it down to 5.5 milliamps at 1 megahertz. Julian once again was encouraging with his comments, take another look at the voltage regulator you're using, he said. Almost four years later and I'm looking again at the AT tiny version of this solar charge controller. In 2019, PCB fabrication is significantly cheaper and therefore I've taken the plunge to design a board for what I'm going to refer to as the PWM85 solar charge controller. Now this design moves away from Julian's sort of design here with the wires coming out of either side for a more traditional connection method. I've placed the connection points in the row at the bottom in the traditional order of solar, battery and load. That decision determined the width of the PCB but as you can see the components on here are not tightly packed. There's quite a bit of room. It also meant I could use quite large components. 1206 resistors and capacitors are far easier for people like me who aren't all that used to surface mount soldering. I was afforded the luxury of a larger space because I modelled this PCB on another. I featured this series of solar charge controllers on my channel some time ago. They were sold in a number of different configurations for different battery chemistries, but I thought the lead acid one was best. The lithium ion versions just kept the cells floating at 4.2 volts per cell indefinitely, which I didn't like. Anyway, the point is that I decided that the PCB in here was going to be the basis for my PCB over here. So as a result, well, this one should just fit in there. Yeah, like that. Perfect. Because I wanted this to be a more traditional build, this has meant I've had to compromise on a few aspects. For good reason, Julian wired the wires for the battery and the solar directly to the MOSFET legs, leaving no requirement for any high current tracks on the PCB. Because I've decided to use all surface mount parts, that just isn't possible. However, I designed the PCB tracks here uh, to be 6mm wide and uh, no more than 13mm long here between the solar and the battery, so hopefully they should be able to carry more than enough current. It's worth mentioning that although there is a load connection on this design, there is no load control. It's simply another point at which you can connect to the battery. But of course that does mean that you could use it as a point to parallel up these controllers if that was perhaps more convenient. I've also taken what I think could be a risk by moving the uh, shocky diode here internally. Julian kept this external for two good reasons. Firstly, not everybody needs it. Lots of solar panels have one fitted and of course some power is lost across it. So Julian fitted it externally so well you could remove it, cut it off. The other advantage about it being mounted outside of the PCB is that it can get quite warm when it's carrying a reasonable current. 
My Shockley diode is rated for 10 amps continuous and is mounted as far away from everything else as possible. I've designed it with a lot of wires through to the other side and uh, have effectively left a bit here which is a bit of a heatsink and I'm hoping that that will be able to keep it cool enough. It does however make it harder to solder of course with all that extra copper and solder. With these terminals rated for 15 amps if you're buying that I think this design should be good for a typical 100 watt 36 cell solar panel operating at about 6 amps. But given the time of year I've not been able to test that fully so there is a bit of an asterisk applied there. So given that I'm trying to match the current consumption of the PWM5 I've looked closely at the low dropout voltage regulator and want to compare three options. So I've built three of these PWM85 boards and fitted them with three different regulators. The original pick design used the uh, LP2950 which I've only got as a through hole component. It has a self consumption of uh, 75 milliamps here. Julian has fitted the HT7550-1 voltage regulator to his surface mount version recently and that has a much much lower quiescent current at 2.5 microamps here compared to 75 on the LP2950. I also found another I think cheaper option from uh, Seawood Electronics the SE8550 which has a rivaling quiescent courage, uh, current sorry, of 2.6 microamps. Right so I've got my meter here in line between the uh, lead acid battery and the solar charge controller here and my first test is here the LP2950. Let's give that one a go. Connect that up and that's giving me a reading of 2.75 milliamps. Well I've got to say actually I'm pretty pleased with that. 2.75 milliamps is half the consumption that I had on my previous version of the AT Tiny solar charge controller because that was uh, using 5.5 milliamps and it is worth mentioning at this point that all of these chips are programmed. They are running the uh, sketch for the uh, solar charge controller. So yeah 2.75 milliamps. Quite pleased. I'll move on to the next one. Right the next test is the HT7550. Let's connect that one up. And that's giving me 2.6 milliamps isn't it? 2.6. And finally the SE8550. Let's try that one. Ever so slightly higher, 2.63, 2.64 milliamps. But to be honest, they're pretty much in the same ballpark, aren't they? 2.5, 2.6 milliamps. So, yeah, yeah, what can I say? All pretty much the same. And just for comparison, this is my first ever solar charge controller here in the shed. The Landstar PWM solar charge controller. I think this is the LS1024. And as you can see, it's consuming, well, 5.5 milliamps. Now there's a good reason why the AT Tiny version consumes more current than the PIC. The AT Tiny is running at a faster clock speed. I've slowed it down as much as I possibly can, but as you can see, 2.5 milliamps seems to be the lowest I can go. Whereas Julian, well, he got just 1 milliamp with the pick. I think I'm going to have to admit defeat on this one. Now, quiescent current isn't the only thing you need to consider when choosing a voltage regulator. Another important factor is accuracy, output accuracy. Now Julian's produced a number of interesting videos about the accuracy of the LP2950 voltage regulator that he originally used in the PWM5. And how inaccuracies in that voltage regulator led to inaccuracies at floating charge voltage on the lead acid battery that his solar charge controllers were connected to. 
Now the uh, surface mount device that Julian has chosen, the Holtec HT7550, has a tolerance of plus or minus 3%, so potentially the battery readings on that lead acid battery could be even worse. But in practice he's finding that this one has a pretty high accuracy. So when I started designing this PCB, I thought it might be worth looking around for another voltage regulator uh, that would suit this project. And uh, this Seawood Electronics one uh, has that low 2.6 microamp current, the same as the Holtec, but it's also got a 1% voltage tolerance here, much like the LP2950. So uh, this seemed like a good option. It also had exactly the same footprint and same pinout as the Holtec HT7550 as well, so they can be swapped out, uh, which was handy. But as a second interesting little test, it might be worth checking the accuracy of these three voltage regulators. But first, it's probably worth us finding out how accurate my uh, meter is here. And this is a voltage reference which I showed on this channel quite some time ago. It's based on a, uh, is it the AD584K? chip there in that little can in there and uh, it's a accurate voltage IC and uh, it can produce two and a half volts five volts seven and a half or ten now this has been on for a little while because these uh, vary with temperature and when this was calibrated at the factory apparently the five volt output gives 5.00056 volts now uh my meter's not that accurate, but we will uh, test it anyway, and we will see what output we get. So let that settle down. So on this apparent accurate 5 volts, my meter is reading 4.997 volts. Okay, 4.997. Now we can check the voltage regulators on these PWM85s. Right, so first things first, the LP2950. I will find a suitable ground point there and choose to use the positive side of this tantalum cap. And I get... So that reading's a little bit high, 5.005 coming from the uh, LP2950. So yeah, that is a little bit high. So the second test here, the uh, Holtec HT7550, let's uh, just get to the same points as I tested on the last one. So compared to my voltage reference of 5 volts, uh, this is reading 5.046. Yeah, definitely a little bit higher than the uh, voltage reference. Right, last one, the SE8550. And finally, the uh, SE8550. Oh, 5.08. So although it claims to have a higher accuracy, this particular IC here is less accurate than the plus or minus 3% of the whole tech. But I guess that can all change with each IC, can't it? Now this sparse PCB has meant that I have been able to uh, add an in-circuit serial programming header for the AT Tiny, so I am able to reprogram these chips quite easily. So for me, the voltage regulator inaccuracies are less of an issue. I can calibrate these quickly and easily. The PWM5 did not have a programming header, so Julian has suggested a calibration method. By notice on his latest through-hole version of the PWM5, he has added an ICSP header. Now, in a comment of my video from the previous attempt, Julian says a 500 kilohertz uh, clock speed gave the best performance versus consumption ratio of the PWM5, and that resulted in a MOSFET gate frequency of 122 hertz. But I imagine the charge pump is uh, running quite a bit higher. Setting the AT Tiny internal clock 
to 1 megahertz creates a standard PWM frequency of 4 kilohertz in fast PWM mode, which works well for the charge pump, which is generating the 20 or so volts needed for the uh, MOSFET gate, but 4 kilohertz is far too high for the MOSFET driver circuit. I've been able to reduce the frequency on uh, PB4 here um, to 125 hertz, which gave me the nicest square wave at the MOSFET gate, whilst being able to leave the charge pump at the more efficient 4 kilohertz. Minimalist code is great, but I want to see some improvements. I've fitted an LED here on PB3, uh, but other than the flash when the controller starts up to show it's working, the LED isn't doing anything. Of course that helps with consumption, but it would be nice to implement some of the functions on the PIC version, where Julian's been able to show not only the battery voltage, but also the amount of modulation on the MOSFET. So that's my latest version of Julian Eilert's ultra low power PWM solar charge controller. My version's not as small, not quite as low power, and it's missing some features. But I think this version may inspire a couple of people to look at solar or look again at Arduino. I intend to send a few of these out to the community, out to people who've inspired me, out to people who might like to modify the code. I've placed the code on GitHub along with the schematics and the Gerber files and once I learn how to use GitHub, hopefully I'll be able to merge other people's suggestions. I'm also going to send one of these to each of my current Patreons. I don't really talk about the fact that I have a Patreon page, but a small number of people have backed me via that method for quite a long time now, and I'm really grateful for their continued support. So this can be taken as a token of my thanks. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video. If you have, give me a thumbs up, subscribe down below, comment if you can, and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.